right, and uh, greetings everybody, and welcome to my uh, continued series on uh, themes of the 20th century. Uh, I've just concluded a three-part uh, series on Russia, and uh, we're going to make a bit of a departure uh, away from Stalinism for the time being and move into something uh, considerably different. Um, we're going to be looking at the USA specifically between the years of 1919 to 1941, which is roughly, what, a 22-year period. And it is remarkable, the transformation that the United States goes into between these, this 22-year period. Because, of course, 1919 is the end of the war. The 20s, right up till 29, were the boom years. And then the Great Depression happens and everything comes to pieces. And then World War II breaks out and that brings the economy back up. So it's, it's very much topsy-turvy times for the United States. Um, I'll admit that when we look at someone like Franklin Roosevelt, it's, it's pretty hard for me sometimes as a historian and as a teacher and a lecturer to sort of contain my uh, appreciation for certain individuals in history. I mean, one thing I've always prided myself on as a teacher is to maintain my objectivity, and I think that that is a that, that should be an expectation, of course, of history teachers, particularly when you're teaching high school, where young people are still sort of finding their way, understanding ideology, understanding history and geography, and putting together their own voice in the process of their learning. So, uh, as a result, it is extremely important uh, for someone like myself, who teaches high school, to maintain that objectivity. But every now and again, it, 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 it is a little bit difficult for me to contain my admiration for certain figures in history. I mean, there are the obvious ones that are sort of universally admired, whether it be Mahatma Gandhi or Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, usually people associated with civil rights and usually people that are maybe unideological, for lack of a better term. Um, but I'll never forget my... Um, grandmother who was uh, born in the state of Missouri, in, or Missouri as they say now. Um, I remember when I was in my early 20s before she passed away and I was studying history in university, I would go down to Seattle to visit her, which is where she was, and I remember one time she, um, I was asking her questions about the 20s and 30s, 30s rather, because she was born in 1909, so she was a flapper in her late teens and the 20s, and she lived through the hardships of the Great Depression as well. And I'll never forget sort of talking to her about who her favorite presidents were and what does she remember the most, but I'll never forget her face lighting up when I asked her who her favorite president was, and very clearly, it was, at that point anyway, in that conversation, it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And she showed me a, a series of video cassette videos she had. Uh, it was a two-part series from the American Experience, which in the 90s they did a whole series of, of uh, documentaries on presidents, uh, which are fabulous, by the way. Um, and she said, she gave this thing to me and said, this was my life. Everything you need or would want to know about life in the 30s is right here. And uh, that really stuck with me. And I remember telling her, I said, well, actually, I can get a copy of this at home, so you hold on to it. And uh, for some reason, that always stuck with me. And uh, of course, as I began to learn more about Roosevelt, learn more about sort of um, the history of American presidents, it's, it's hard to deny that there was something remarkable about Franklin Roosevelt, but certainly he was not without his detractors. So, but we're going to we're going to start in 1919, which is of course a full 14 years before Franklin Roosevelt comes to office. Here he is on the top with all his uh, close allies and cabinet members with him, and this is a very famous photograph taken from the 1920s. I still get nauseous when I think about sitting on a beam that high in the sky. So, quite remarkable. All right, <clears throat> what I did, I did this more just for fun, and uh, we don't need to spend too much time on it, but I, I was just brainstorming things that I associated with the 1920s or sort of main themes, and this is sort of what I came up with. Of course, prohibition uh, dominates uh, the culture of the 1920s. Al Capone, who is of course a great benefactor of prohibition. Speakeasies were 
illegal bars that everyone attended and everybody went to. The radio changes the landscape of American society because now you can sit in the comfort of your own living room and listen to programs. Consumerism, people are buying stuff in the 1920s. That's why there was a boom. Buy, 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 purchase, purchase, purchase. Um, but that leads to problems because once everybody's bought everything they want, yet companies keep producing stuff and people stop buying it, overproduction becomes one of the main causes of the Great Depression. Model T Fords, of course, uh, I think um, Henry Ford said uh, you can have it in whatever color you want so long as it's black, hence only black Model T Fords. Uh, jazz goes through a major renaissance. Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, you name it. There's so many great uh, jazz performers that are born out of the 20s and 30s. The Scopes Monkey Trial, um, right, which deals with uh, uh, the teaching of, um, of, of Darwin in the classroom. And it's a big topic. We'll come back and look at that another time. Flappers were liberated young women of the 20s. The KKK sees a resurgence in the 20s and 30s. Youth Rebellion, Ernest Hemingway, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, College Football, Huey Long, Fraternities, Mass Communication, Louis Armstrong, and of course, what better way to end the 20s with in, a, in, a, in this context than the Charleston. Of course, dancing was, was quite a craze in the 1920s. So, so the 1920s, I mean, was an incredibly dynamic uh, time, a very, very exciting time to be young, a very exciting time to be alive. And certainly that generation of the 1920s, uh, the great Gatsby generation, um, never ever could have predicted what would befall them in 1929. And uh, when we get to 1929, I hope to explain that process very clearly so you can understand what exactly, how did the Great Depression happen? Because I can only imagine that People who lived it at the time must have been completely perplexed and overwhelmed and confused by the experiences uh, they found themselves in during that dark period of history. All right, let's move on. Just a couple of pictures here. Are a couple of uh, police officers who have raided probably a speakeasy. They're now dumping the illegal elixir into the drains. Uh, I often wonder how many they stuck in their back pocket while no one was looking. Uh, and then, of course, a typical scene of a, of a factory or where, you know, mass production of goods is, is um, moving significantly. So, you know, you have to consider that the, the machinery of mass production was already in place because that had been built and developed during the war years where there was a demand for helmets and guns and canned food and everything in between, medical supplies that needed to be mass produced to um, uh, bring these supplies to American boys in Europe uh, where they would be fighting um, by the fall of 1917. So, so when that war comes to an end, all those factories that have been play, uh, um, making war goods, rather, are now making consumer goods. So consumerism is driven by this ability to mass produce products. So there's a Model T Ford here. There's some girls dancing, doing the Charleston likely, and the one and only, probably one of the greatest jazz performers, Louis Armstrong. I always thought it was Louis, but Historians have now corrected many of us and said, no, it was actually Louis Armstrong. So, uh, yeah. So, the end of World War I resulted in the USA being the greatest economic power in the world. And World War I encouraged massive production, which continued into the post-war years. And coming back to the idea, that's why they were able to mass produce so much. War had been very good for the American economy. Uh, we see this happen again in the 1950s, right? That that war for democracies who are not fighting on the front, so to speak, that are not being bombed or shelled, um, certainly Canada would be part of that too. That, that can, both the Canadian and the American economies did very, very well during the war and always very well in the immediate post-war. So as I said, you look at the 20s, lots of boom, lots of things being made, lots of wealth being earned, 
and the 1950s were the boom years as well after the Second World War. The Republican governments of the 1920s, uh, Cal uh, Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover, all were, these guys were really riding the wave, if you will, of, of great economic success. So because they were largely conservative Republican governments, they were cutting taxes. You know, you give people more expendable income, the more money they have to buy the stuff that's being mass produced. So, you know, technically the market economy should just kind of feed on itself and then grow and grow and grow and grow. But there, I mean, there were hints that the economy was overheating, but because the American economy had never been in a state like this, an accelerated mass production and, 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 and wealth and employment and so on and so forth, nobody could really understand how this bubble was going to burst, as it would in 1929. Wages increased and a consumer society would develop. So consumerism almost has to be taught. That is, you need to teach people to want to buy stuff. How do you do that? Well, newspapers, advertisements in newspapers, advertisements on the radio, billboards on the street, um, advertisements in movie theaters when people are not going to the movies. Um, so there was a constant exposure to um, advertising, and advertising fuels people's desire to buy stuff. So, you know, advertising was a big part of, of what fueled the consumer society of the 1920s. People now could also buy consumer goods on credit or higher purchase. So, you know, um, because the economy was doing so well, banks were pretty good and pretty easy to get to and borrow money from. So you wanted to buy a new car, you didn't have the X amount of dollars that it cost, so you went to the bank, you borrowed the money, you made payments for five years, once a month or 10 years, whatever it was uh, agreed upon. And, you know, the banks are loaning out money so people can buy this stuff. And the banks were really worrying about it because there was so much wealth being generated that everybody was making money. And certainly uh, the banks had always done well as well with their interest rates, certainly for mortgage interest alone can fuel uh, the banking industry. So, well, now we're going to start talking about the process that leads to this incredible bubble bursting, um, because boy does it ever, and it catches everybody off guard. Um, the widespread use of machinery led to overproduction on farms and prices fell for both food and industrial goods. Here's the tragedy. First of all, let's talk about something called the Fordney-McCumber Tariff, I believe was implemented in 1922. The Fordney-McCumber Tariff. Basically what this is, is that it was a tariff that put taxes on imported goods so that American-made goods would be cheaper on the open American market. So let me give you an example, um, and I'll use, uh, let's use radios for example, even though it's not a great metaphor because it was the Americans who were predominantly making radios, um, but here's, here's the case scenario. RCA is making radios and Germany is importing radios. Germany is importing radios for $20 a radio for the consumer to purchase. Um, however, the Americans are selling radios for $22. And, you know, between a $20 radio and a $22 radio, which one are American consumers going to buy if they essentially do the same thing? They will buy the $20 German radio. So what you do is you slap a $3 tax on every imported radio from Germany. Therefore, that radio becomes a $23 radio to um, Americans, and the American-made becomes 22. Which are you gonna buy now? You're gonna buy American-made, right? Now, American uh, protectionism, this is, what, this is what protectionism is, protecting local industries. It certainly makes sense from a business point of view, but who loses out in a protectionist environment? The consumer. Why? Because they're paying more money for American-made products than they need to because import taxes are put on products coming in from overseas or other countries. Okay, So 
The reason this is important is because when the American economy begins to overheat and they want to unload and dump their surplus produced goods overseas, a lot of countries are saying, no, we're going to put tariffs on your stuff, you know, like you did to us. So protectionism can get, you can get into tax wars or trade wars as they're called, and that can be really, really ugly and cause a lot of problems. So basically what happens here is once everybody has purchased a radio, coming back to that metaphor in the United States, what happens then to the radio making industry when the market's been satiated? What happens if nobody needs a radio anymore? Well, they pile up. People stop buying radios. People working in the radio industries are laid off because there's no work. Same thing happens in agriculture. They mechanized their agriculture in the 1920s and they overproduced. Right? It's a remarkable thing to think that part of the reason for the Great Depression is simply because the Americans produced more than they needed to satisfy the American market. It's a strange phenomenon. So overproduction would be cause number one. Unsold goods, as we said, piled up and manufacturers produced less. As less was sold, people are laid off. That's the vicious cycle. Around this same time, but more particularly in the mid-20s, mid because the banks were loaning money so you could go buy a car or get a mortgage for a house or, or whatever it is that you wanted to buy, some banks didn't really question what you were taking the money out for. So if you wanted to take $1,000 out of the bank to invest in the stock market, well, that's risky business, but people were doing that. And people were buying stocks for things that they didn't really understand it almost became kind of fashionable to buy stocks right so oh well my neighbors do it I probably should do the same so you can buy stocks on margin which means that you can buy stocks for a very very low price so give you an example let's pretend and I know this isn't the case but let's pretend coca-cola is a brand new company and they don't have any capital but they've got an idea so they sell shares on the stock market new soda pop company revolutionary taste looking for investors so you invest X amount of stocks in this new soda pop company you buy the stocks for 50 cents a share and you sit and you watch it goes up to 51 and then 52 and then it jumps to 56 and you're thinking this is great and it continues to go up and up and up and up and then it stops for a moment at 65 you're thinking what's going on there and then if it begins to dip down 63, 62, you've got to make a decision. Are you going to cash your chips now or are you going to wait this out? I mean, this was get this is classic gambling. It can be extremely addictive. And you've got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them, to use a Kenny, uh, Kenny Rogers metaphor. Um, and that's the difficult thing. You've got to know at what point is the best time to take out your stocks, right? And that's kind of where what's going on. Now, if you're borrowing money from a bank, if you lose that, then you can't pay the bank back. Then the bank gets hurt, and you get hurt, things begin to happen. I'll get more into that later. Many spent their savings or borrowed money to buy stocks. The real tragedy of, of this whole phenomenon were the people that invested their hard-earned money into the stock market to make a few extra bucks before retirement. So you're retiring, you've got 50000 of a nest egg, you're going to invest it in the stock market so maybe you can walk away with 65000 and you know, but what happens if you lose it? Right? So, I mean, it's a gamble and, and because people didn't understand it and could really fully appreciate the possibility of losing money, um, then you've got to be careful. Right now, during this uh, pandemic, I'm doing this lecture during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, I just cashed in um, a t my TFSA, a mutual fund, because it had dipped, it had gone up, and it was getting to the point where it was approaching the, the point at which how much I put into it, right? And I thought, there's no way I'm going to dip down. I'm not a chance taker, I'm not a gambler. So I pulled that money out before I lost money on it, and I put it in a high interest, uh, high interest savings account. And I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it will go back up. I'm sure it will eventually. But the thought of it going back down and my memory and understanding of this period of history really put my radar up. So, you know, during difficult economic times, you don't want to be playing with money. It's very, very um, risky business.
On Black Thursday, the 24th of October, 1929, 13 million shares were dumped and prices collapsed. 13 shares dumped. What that means is that as stock prices began to fall, dip down, everybody's going to the stock market to pull their shares out. So coming back to Coca-Cola as a metaphor, um, if Coca-Cola exists because of stockholders' investments, and there's no regulation to say that you can't pull your stocks out whenever you want. And everybody does it at the same time. What do you think is going to happen to Coca-Cola? Poof, gone, right? So all of a sudden, everything's coming to pieces. Thousands lost their savings as the banks collapsed. Those people who had invested money, their own capital, lost it all. The banks that were not very frugal about how much they lent, they collapsed because they could not get the money back that they loaned people who lost it in the stock market. So, um, you know, the banks got to be held accountable to some degree for this uh, chaos, chaotic situation. Here's uh, hundreds of people heading to the stock market to, to cash their chips, so to speak. So, very, very challenging. Okay, let's... I just want to revisit some of the things we just talked about because I want to, I want to clarify this because I really, really believe it is extremely important to understand uh, what happened here because um, we had a similar set of circumstances in 2008 and right now we are facing very unstable economic times too and I think this is a point at which we can really learn from history. Speculation meant buying shares at a low price and then selling them when they increase, right? We talked about that. The trick is knowing when to sell, right? You can get greedy. I mean, if it keeps going up and up and up, you're not going to want to pull them out and only to find out that they've continued rising. You want to know when they kind of, when the bell curve reaches the top and then it begins to kind of slope down. People spent their savings and in some cases borrowed to buy shares. As we said, the people that went to the bank that borrowed money to invest in the stock market only to lose it. You lose it, the bank loses it too. Uh, and that's why, by the way, before we come back, that's why the bank was, was taking people's homes. Because if you had a mortgage with a bank and then you couldn't pay back your loan, then they would, re, they would take your home, right? And, and lock you out, and then you would have to you'd be on the street, right? So, a domino effect of dumping occurred, and on October 24th, 1929, as stated before, 13 million shares were dumped. Thousands lost their savings or were in debt to banks for shares bought on credit. Okay, so does that make sense? So the causes, overproduction uh, over was a cause of the depression, Economic protectionism for the McCumber tariff was a cause, and the stock market crash was a cause. And they were all linked economically, but those were sort of the three main contributing factors to how this whole bubble burst. Well, by 1932, 25% of Americans were out of work. Um, Hoover's ideas of self-reliance and rugged individualism rang hollow. Now, we haven't talked about Herbert Hoover, but he becomes president in 1928. Poor guy, just had the misfortune of being president when this whole uh, house of cards collapsed. So, you have to put that in perspective that nobody had ever dealt with this kind of economic collapse. Because he was a relatively conservative Republican, fiscally conservative, I guess would be a better choice of words, he was not interested in using public money to dig people out of this depression. In fact, instead he said, hey, we're Americans, we're rugged individualists, we're hardworking. By the, the, the sheer force of the American spirit, we'll dig ourselves out of this. Well, that rang pretty hollow to people that lost their homes, right? It's going to take more than rugged individualism to get out of this thing. During the 1932 presidential debates, of course, you have this new player on the scene who was not really new. He'd been a, you know, in politics for decades himself. Um, he's talking about extensive government intervention to stimulate demand and create jobs, which was very appealing. So Hoover had to kind of sit and wait and see what happens. And FDR was, let's do this, we're going to take action right away. 
the other fundamental difference, not only economically between these two, is the fact that Franklin Roosevelt had a really uh, charming personality, and and Hoover didn't, and, and and you know he just didn't know what to say to the American people. He didn't know how to. I mean, he tried in a limited way to remedy the Depression, but he just didn't have the communication skills required to reassure the American people. And when Roosevelt comes in, of course, he uses the, the radio as a tool uh, to communicate to the American people and, uh, and uh, get them to, to, to feel that they're being looked after and taken care of by this president. So his fireside chats were very, very effective. In addition, Roosevelt was very charismatic and could speak simply to the people. Oh, there we are. Yeah, so he had this way of communicating complex ideas in very simple, easily understandable and digestible forms. So he had that. This is where I think, uh, you know, we've talked many times about personality and leadership and so forth. Roosevelt had that personality. He was very endearing. Even if it was all just a front, he certainly was good at making people feel like he really cared. He was generally a good listener. Uh, people walked away from conversations with Roosevelt saying, you know, I feel like you really listened to me and he really cared about me. I mean, call that good, good diplomatic skill, good, good, good leadership skill, whatever you want. Um, but to me, that is such a big part of the equation for good leadership is how you communicate to to your people, you know, when you look at the people in history who are seen as great leaders, oftentimes they have those interpersonal leadership type skills, good communicators, right? So, all right, well, by 1930-31, this is what we're confronting, mass unemployment and mass homelessness. These makeshift shelters were, you know, made by people, unemployed men, who you know, were either kicked out of their apartment or didn't have a place to live. So they built these things and usually like sports fields or public parks became places where people would build these 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 shanty towns, for lack of a better term. And oftentimes they would be nicknamed Hoovervilles because as, as 1929 rolls into 30 and 30 into 31, uh, Hoover's um, ineptitude really begins to um, become expressed by the American people, you know, like newspapers were called Hoover Blankets and things like that, so not a good situation. All right, there he is. Uh, between three years during his presidency, 12 and a half million Americans become unemployed. He believed that government help uh, for the public was practically socialism. Oh my gosh, we can't help people. We can't feed them because it'll look socialistic. I mean. It's an interesting idea, you know, but, but at the same time, we'll take care of your people and then we can move on from there. There, there was just such a reluctance and fear of being associated with having socialistic policies. He did little to support those in need. Now, I should be clear, he didn't do this out of cruel. He was not a cruel man. There's nothing like that. He just lacked creativity in how to economically tackle this situation. Right? You need creativity and you need people, advisors around you that, that are creative as well. So encourage everyone to make it on their own and in time things will get better. Boy, that, <laughs> that rang pretty hollow and as things got worse and he said just hang in there, it'll get better, uh, that just, you know, things got worse and worse. So between that four year period, there was mass unemployment, homelessness, Hoovervilles we call them. Farm evictions and bank closures were rampant. You know, here are the hardships people face. You know, traveling from the Midwest to California looking for work. Lineups of people looking for food. There was mass protests, the rise of the Communist Party, of course. Poor leadership, economic sloppiness resulted in a strong desire for change in leadership. By 1932, people had had enough of Hoover and they wanted something different and they needed something different. And fortunately, they had someone who was making some pretty broad sweeping claims, Franklin Roosevelt talking about his New Deal. Well, the proof would have to be in the pudding, right? But, uh, you know, I always say that it's, it's so easy to make promises when you're vying for a position of leadership. 
it's a lot easier to make promises than it actually is to fulfill them once you become leader. So I'm sure all eyes were on FDR when he becomes elected. There he is there. You know, and such a big part of the leadership piece is, as I said earlier, making people feel like you really truly want to do something for them. Like you're really going to take care of things. And in his inauguration speech, in, uh, which would have been, I guess it would have been January 1933, he would have been elected in November 1932, uh, he makes quite a powerful speech, but one line that is reverberated in history, that is quoted over and over, and it is for a reason. The line is, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. So what does that mean? Roosevelt understood that people had become crippled by fear. Every time somebody moved, something worse happened. So nobody was moving. And I mean this metaphorically, of course. Nobody was moving. He said, look, people, it's just fear. It's nothing to fear here. It's just fear itself that you have to fear. Now we can move forward because it's just fear. There is nothing to fear but fear itself. Remarkable. Simple, but very reassuring to people. Well, he's got his hands full, and in his first hundred days, as they're called, he puts a plan to tackle immediate problems. Number one, the Emergency Banking Act saw weak banks closed, and only the sound ones were to reopen. Why is it so important that the banking system be brought back online? Well, for, I mean, you know, interest rates, all these things, the market economy is dependent, there's a tight relationship obviously between the banking industry and the markets, between the stock markets and everything else. And Roosevelt knew that people were no longer wanting to put their money, people were scared to put money in the bank. In fact, the whole sort of narrative of people putting their savings in their mattresses that's born out of this period. Um, Roosevelt said those banks that were more reckless in their loaning will be closed permanently and the ones that exhibited greater discretion will be kept open and out of that people will be able to then hopefully and tentatively I'm sure return to putting money back in the banks. His fireside chats gave FDR the opportunity to explain things to Americans. This was I believe like a weekly program, families would get together, lists sit on the floor around the radio and they'd hear Franklin Roosevelt speak and he had such a it's kind of a, a, a reassuring voice as well so a lot he had a lot going for him that way. The Federal Emergency Relief Act saw half a million dollars in aid directed to unemployed and poor so Roosevelt just didn't want to throw people money. He gave this money to the poor so he said here's something immediate so you can get cleaned up, you can pay your rent, you can buy a new set of clothes, um, and you can get out there and start looking for another job. It was a way of the immediate relief, and, and it wasn't intended to be like, you know, this is, we're just going to keep doling this out. This is to get you by until you can begin to think about finding ways of taking care of yourself. The money provided work, though, not charity, and I'll talk about that when we get to the New Deal. FDR also abolished prohibition to encourage pleasant escapism. Well, yeah, of course, <laughs> pleasant escapism. He also knew it because he knew that um, prohibition or the, the re-legalization of alcohol could be a potentially huge uh, tax cow. And those taxes are going to be desperately needed to pay the huge expenses which will be incurred by his New Deal alphabet law programs. So, All right, so... So many, so many things are are coming off the uh, the, Ro the Roosevelt administration's platform. So many programs are coming. Uh, people were overwhelmed, and that's why they became known as the Alphabet Laws. And I'll explain why. First one, and not necessarily in this order, the CCC or Civilian Conservation Corps provided work and reforestation and park services. So. You know, get people working, your employees of the government, the Works Progress Administration, as it was called, WPA, 
um, was another one, different than this one, but the same idea. Get people working in this case in, in, in park trail making, uh, planting trees. Um, so you're, you're employing people by the government and paying them, but you're having them do things that are practical. The WPA, or Works Progress Administration, um, financed road, school, and hospital building, as well as dams and bridges. All these things are things that are going to have long-term benefits to American communities. It's not like, you know, having somebody dig ditches in, in the interior somewhere just for the sake of doing something. He's actually saying, no, we're going to build schools and roads and hospitals and bridges. And, 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 and so when all this depression hard times passes, we will still have the, the evidence of these great um, New Deal programs that uh, produced all these infrastructural services for Americans. The NRA, National Recovery Act, abolished child labor, created a minimum wage and an eight-hour workday. So once again, you're, 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 you're not only creating jobs, but you're creating um, healthy work environments and uh, healthy wages and all those kind of things. The TVA, which was called the Tennessee Valley Authority, set up a series of dams through seven states to provide hydroelectricity to remote communities. The AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, gave subsidies to farmers who produced less. Okay, think about this for a minute. FDR is giving farmers money so they produce less. Why on earth would he want people to produce less? The reason is because they had overproduced. And once you produce too much of hay, let's say, I'm just using that as a metaphor, and everybody's bought hay and there's still way more than people are willing to buy, prices collapse and, and farms collapse as well. Because everybody's broke and losing money because nobody's buying stuff. So, in other words, he wants farms to produce just enough to make sure that prices are stable and the markets are stable and he will talk you up with government funding to make sure that, that there's stability in supply and demand. Very creative, innovative ideas here. Um, just looking at these pictures, by the way, here he is, of course, sitting on the back of a vehicle, shaking hands with a farmer. Vanity Fair magazine has the great puppeteer controlling business interests and labor. I mean, he had to tackle with both, you know. The other thing we should note about Roosevelt was that he was not able to walk. Um, he was stricken with polio in 1921, at which time he lost his ability to walk. And, um, you know, the fact that he was uh, disabled... Um, was one of the best kept secrets and in fact uh, Roosevelt didn't want the American people to know. He was afraid that if they knew that he couldn't walk that it, they would somehow they would lose their confidence in him which is quite sad because he was a great man either way it had nothing to do with whether he could walk or not but in fact um, he had these very very heavy duty braces made from his waist to his ankles that were um, very very heavy and they basically meant that they would hold him up and he could actually sort of waddle in them. So the only time he really wore them was when he would have to kind of get up and, and, and stand at a podium. And when he would do speeches, he would be sitting in a wheelchair to the side of the stage, and then he would need help getting up. And then he would just sort of, you know, with the help of his, I think it was his son-in-law, you look at pictures of him, and he's got this man kind of walking with him to the podium. And then once... Roosevelt was on the podium, he would just stand there for dear life, make his speech, and then he would be escorted off the stage, and when he was out of view of the audience, he would collapse from exhaustion into his wheelchair. So I believe that during his whole presidency, there was only ever one official picture taken of him in a wheelchair, and that was, I think, Life magazine got the rights to do that. I think it was during the war years, but... Um, Remarkable, remarkable person, you know, and so in many ways, you know, that's why Eleanor Roosevelt, his wife, was so important. I mean, she was a remarkable woman, too, a tremendously sensitive to social justice issues. She becomes the eyes and ears of um, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, 
I mean, basically what ends up happening is that he can't freely travel all over the world. He can't freely, you know, drive down to, um, you know, Louisiana and check out the conditions of African Americans in the poor parts of uh, New Orleans or whatever it may be. <clears throat> so she becomes the eyes and ears of Franklin Roosevelt, and she was very, very active in sort of reaching out into communities and then reporting to Franklin Roosevelt. And, uh, you know, she had a weekly column. She was a very, very activist first lady, and I think in many ways Eleanor Roosevelt sort of sets the template, if you will, for the expectation of what first ladies should and could be doing uh, after the Roosevelt uh, administration was over. So. Well, as if the Depression and everything else that was going wrong wasn't bad enough, then you have this situation in the Midwest known as the Dust Bowl. In 1934, um, the American Midwest suffered a catastrophic heat wave followed by strong winds. The conditions of the Dust Bowl was not only exacerbated by the heat and the lack of rain, but the fact that the mechanization of agriculture had led to the kinds of repetitive tilling you'd never seen before. Um, and when you are constantly tilling land and mechanizing it, it, has, it can be quite vulnerable. And, and when it dries up, there's a lot of loose soil and it just blows in the, blows in the wind. So, I mean, pretty remarkable situation. Uh, and here you can see a big storm of dust coming in. So what would happen in the Midwest is you would have somebody who would be designated to be on sort of like a lifeguard tower with a pair of binoculars and he would be looking around all over the place and then um, if he saw a dust storm coming he would ding a bell and everybody would run in their homes and close their doors and put wet towels around the rim of the doors and this thing would just kind of rumble in and the sky would go black and you could hear the, the dirt spinning against the windows and the house would shake and then it would pass. And, you know, when you would open the door, it'd just be, you'd see this, just heaps and heaps and heaps of dust. Things, cars are getting buried. Um, you know, there's so many health problems related to the dust storm because young children were inhaling dirt and dying from pneumonia type symptoms. And, you know, if you had respiratory issues to begin with, you wouldn't want to be living in the Midwest at this time. So very, very challenging. Crops were destroyed and the soil was blown away. Farmers would relocate to city centers to find work, but there wasn't much to go around. And unemployment was still high. Many of these farmers, by the way, in the Midwest, they, when they lost everything, they would pack up their jalopies, their old uh, Model T Fords, with everything they could, pack their family in, and drive to California. That's where everybody went. Drove to California during the Dust Bowl. You know, and nobody really expresses the hardships faced by these farmers better than uh, Woody Guthrie, the great folk uh, singer of the 1930s who wrote so eloquently of the hardships faced by people, not only in the Dust Bowl, but people who faced hardship during the Great Depression. But, you know, so hundreds of thousands of people would be traveling from the Midwest to uh, California, and it, it got so busy on the California border that they had to put up a border guard and only let so many people in a day. So even if you got there, you might be turned away. You know, on so many occasions where families are driving in their jalopies and it breaks down. And then you grab your suitcase and you walk with your family. You know, it's just unbelievable hardship. You might run across a restaurant and beg for a meal and say, look, we'll do dishes for the evening if you give us a dinner kind of a thing. So you know, very, very desperate, difficult times, you know. And you got to keep in mind that there was no social safety net at this time either, so you couldn't just go get an unemployment check. That's essentially what Roosevelt is doing, is he's creating a system that catches people and helps them, uh, but also gives them meaningful work at the same time. Well, as you can likely imagine, the New Deal is costing a lot of money. Prohibition or the, the re legalization of alcohol is providing money, but also higher tax rates on the wealthy is creating revenue for the New Deal. And you can imagine the wealthy are very, very resentful <coughs> of the New Deal. So the wealthy and business class resented the safety nets of the New Deal and particularly something called the Wagner Act. 
the most sort of radical of all of um, Roosevelt's policies, which gave trade unions the right to negotiate and strike. Because there was so much violence in, 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 the, in the labor movement, so much violence on the docks, you know, look at on the waterfront. Um, Marlon Brando, I think, wasn't that 1954? Um, but I mean, just that narrative of he wanted to break the cycle of, 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 of violence and anger and exploitation. So he says, look, businesses, you guys have to negotiate with the union. Come up, come up with some agreement. Just hammer it out. Everyone's got to compromise. The Supreme Court generally disapproved of the New Deal. And by 1937, the Supreme Courts largely came on board after the controversy surrounding the court packing incident. What the court packing incident was, is that in America's Constitution, I believe it's right in the Constitution, there are nine Supreme Court judges. Well, the Supreme Court had always been traditionally conservative, and they were pretty much blocking a lot of Roosevelt's New Deal programs. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Nope, veto. So, Roosevelt suggests that they increase the number of Supreme Court judges from 9 to 15, and of course the six additions that he hoped to add to the Supreme Court would be sympathetic to the New Deal. Um, of course the Americans were, no, no, it's messing with the Constitution, you can't do that, he was called a fascist, he was called a communist, you name it. Um, but, of course, that doesn't happen, but it does make the nine Supreme Court judges a little bit more uh, willing to be open-minded when it came to his New Deal program. So the court packing incident was, uh, was a pretty big deal. Anytime you mess with the American Constitution in the States, it becomes a huge problem or a big controversy. Just look at gun laws, for example. The gun lobby is, uh, is quite something, the NRA. All right, so before Pearl Harbor, the USA was neutral, but FDR sympathized with Britain. <clears throat> of course, when war breaks out in September of 39, the USA is isolationist, they're not in it, and it's very similar to the First World War, right, what happened with Wilson. In March of 1941, FDR persuades Congress to agree to lend lease, and it enabled Britain to get essential supplies from the USA. FDR had to be very, very creative. I mean, he and Winston Churchill are spending a lot of time together. FDR is extremely sympathetic to Great Britain and their plight as they face the 57 continuous days of bombing at the hands of the Nazis during the Battle of Britain or the Blitz. Um, so he needs to find, how can I support our friends in Great Britain um, while we are neutral, right? Well, or, or, you know, at least we're not in the war at this time. And basically, once Britain knows that they're getting these supplies from the U.S., remember, this is before the Americans were in the war, March of 41. They don't join till December 7, or probably the day after Pearl Harbor is when they declare war, uh, in 1941. So right now, the Americans are supplying Britain with all these supplies, right? Now, how does he convince the American people to do this because they're very, very resistant to getting involved in any sort of foreign ventures. Um, well, first of all, it marks the end of isolationism from European affairs and it would continue through the war and was extended to the USSR. So the Soviets get lend lease too. And how he um, explains it to the American people in one of his fireside chats is brilliant. It's classic. Roosevelt. He says, it's like loaning a neighbor a garden hose, only to get it back when the neighbor finished watering the lawn. And everyone goes, oh, okay, we're loaning them a water hose to water their lawn when, when, when they're done and get it back. Well, sounds great in principle, but when you're loaning somebody tanks, guns, bullets, airplanes, and other military hardware, chances are pretty slim you're going to get them back. But anyway, that was FDR's magic. Well, there's a lot more, of course, to talk about, and once again, we will get into the details. I do have that three-part series on uh, the Second World War that goes into great detail of the American effort in World War II. So for our purposes, that's where we're going to stop, uh, is, is before America enters the war. Uh, 
In a very general sense, it is not unreasonable to suggest that Franklin Roosevelt restored faith of ordinary Americans in, democ in American democracy. Because he argued that people who are hungry and are out of a job are the stuff of what dictatorships are made from. He recognized that if he didn't get actively involved in fixing this economy, then they would be susceptible to the appeal of fascists and communists. You know, I mean, he understood that they needed to do something to make the economy better. They needed to do something and, and, and to get get Americans back to work and, and, and back to feeling good about themselves again. Most supporters believe that the New Deal ensured that the U.S. remained democratic and full employment would be restored after the U.S. entered the war in December 1941. So when war does break out, um, it will uh, uh, really get that economy going just like it did in the First World War as well. So. After his death in April 1945, many of New Deal's, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal programs would lay the groundwork for the creation of responsible government intervention in public affairs which have continued to this day. In the United States anyway, he is, he, his policies had a tremendous long-term um, impact on, on American democracy. I mean, he had so changed the landscape of American democracy. Um, you know, plus he was in power for, you know, nearly 13, 14 years, so he was into his fourth term at the time, so truly remarkable. And there he is there, always charming, and on the bottom, the most famous picture, I believe, of Franklin Roosevelt right there, and, uh, yeah. All right, and there you have it. So like I say, if you're interested in the uh, American involvement during the Second World War, please do look at my uh, three-part series on World War II. And once again, thank you very much for taking the time to watch my um, lecture. And uh, as I say and have said many times before, don't hesitate to make a comment on my YouTube channel, uh, any suggestions or any requests of any kind. And I appreciate you watching. Take care.